Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Zishan Aziz, and you're in track two. You're uh, watching using OSIN and NLP to track jihadists in conflict zones. Um, a little bit about my background. I just graduated from the University of Miami. I did this research when uh, a year ago when I was interning at Immunity Inc. Immunity Inc. has since been acquired by AppGate Security, and one of the other companies that we worked with was uh, Brainspace, which is the analytics platform that we're used for this research. I've been doing open source intelligence for a very, very long time. Uh, in the years past, I've been very active at DEF CON's Recon Village, either at, uh, as a volunteer or just as an attendee. Um, I've previously talked at conferences like Countermeasure in Ottawa, Canada, and Pacific Hackers Conference in San Francisco. So a little bit of disclaimer, uh, the usual, you know, these views are my own. They don't reflect my current or past employers. Uh, the subjects of this talk uh, that we'll be going through, they haven't been convicted of any crimes and I don't accuse them of any crimes. Um, we uh, redacted the names of people that are um, still active on social media for their privacy. Um, and any views on culture and religion on my own. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Middle East and uh, the country of Syria, which has a very sad and complicated uh, war going out. Uh, this presentation isn't about what group is good, what group is bad. This is just an academic research endeavor. And uh, if you guys have any questions, you can drop it on the Discord, uh, either in a general channel or send it to me directly if, uh, you, if it's something private. So uh, if you guys read the bio of the talk, we're going to be talking about someone called uh, Salman Belarus. He is the commander of a group called Mohama Tactical in uh, Syria, predominantly out of Idlib, Syria. I found out about him like a year and a half, two years ago, um, because he was pretty popular on Twitter. And I was reading a bit about private military contractors like Avian Barlow and Blackwater. Um, he is kind of significant in being the first private military contractor that's like a Muslim group out of Syria. And the other interesting thing about him is that uh, he had faked his death uh, at earlier, uh, a couple of years ago. He came under a new name. Um, there's a lot of information about him open source. Uh, and we're going to be talking about, um, you know, how modern counterinsurgencies have changed and how Salman Belarus and Mohama Tactical is a great example of these trends. So uh, the first list is we have some of his aliases. Uh, in Russia, someone leaked uh, information from police records about who this person may be, but uh, I can't really independently verify if that's true. So uh, we're not 100% sure if that's his name. We could see that he went by several names. The first name he went by was Abu Rafiq, and that guy was uh, killed in an airstrike. And then he came back as uh, Salman Belarus, and um, came back with a new Twitter handle. And uh, people on the OSIN world online were able to match his facial features and his voice print and determine that it was the same exact person. Uh, he's really interesting because uh, he speaks several languages, including Russian, Turkish, Uzbek, and English. Uh, his group provides small arms and uh, tactics training. Uh, you can see on the top, there's a RPG training that his group is giving. And on the bottom, it's a, a, a raid in the mountains that they're doing. Uh, he claims that his group is made up of formal spe former special forces from all over the world. Um, and that's hard to independently verify. But we do know from, you can see the video below, that his group is using suppressors to do these early morning raids. These tactics are definitely borrowed from the special forces world. So the, they're very sophisticated and they kind of have brought uh, some of these regional conflicts into Syria onto a new level when it comes to the sophistication of these actors. So well, this is an OSIN conference. So why are we talking about this guy in Syria? Because uh, he's a really cool outlier in the OSIN community. He is, um, openly talks to re researchers. Uh, we could see on the right, that is a uh, 
diagram of people he's tweeting at or that have tweeted at him. Oh, it's over 100 people. He openly discusses his group's training tech tactics and procedures, um, which is a goldmine for people that follow this in the intelligence community, like at the National Counterterrorism Center in the US. Um, and because he has a public unlocked Twitter profile, you know, we can get a look at his online network and maybe that can give us some clue as to who he is or who knows him in person. And if we scrape this data, we get a very highly, you know, targeted data set that's really rich for this kind of investigations. So this is a little bit uh, of visualization of how we scrape the data, the methodology. So at the top, we had uh, Salman Belarus's account. Uh, we downloaded 200 of his most recent tweets. This was in November 2018. Uh, then we downloaded and we looked at all of his about 3,000 followers, and we got 200 tweets from each. Those tweets include images, they include uh, ads to other people, they include external links, they include uh, anything that a tweet can contain. Um, so what does that data look like um, from, from a very pretty point of view? Uh, this is in Brainspace, the analytics software that we used. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of like similar to Multigo or uh, Analyst Notebook, if any of you have used that. Um, we could see on the bottom end is uh, Salman Belarus's red node, and then these are all other people related to him. This data set had about 308,000 tweets. Um, on the top right, you can see that there's about 11,000 accounts, and these are people either related to him with one or two degrees of separation. Um, So now is uh, the technology stack. We already talked about how Python was used in the data gathering phase for this project. Um, Brainspace, which is our analytics platform, stores the data. It allows us to sort data, and it does some basic natural language analysis. Brainspace is very uh, popular in the um, e-discovery space. It competes with other programs like Relativity and Palantir. Um, another thing we did at, at uh, Immunity was we got all that Twitter data and we ingested it into Google Cloud into their Vision API. So that, what that does is it takes all the tweets and no matter what language it's in, it'll translate it, it'll do opti optical character recognition on all the images that are linked to tweets and um, it'll label images as well. So what it lets us really do is on the bottom, you can see like, hey, like I wanna write a query that says, show me all the tweets today in Arabic where someone talked about the city of Idlib and posted a picture of a gun. You can't really do that natively on Twitter. Um, you, uh, Twitter doesn't allow you to search by image description. And um, it, it is a bit costly to translate everything so Twitter definitely wouldn't do that with their fire hose. It would just be way too expensive. Um, the other really cool thing about uh, translating things through Google Cloud is that now I don't have to be a linguist. My data set can be in Turkish or in Arabic or any other foreign language. All I need to understand is culturally who the group I'm looking at is or how they operate. But the most of the translation is done even if it's not perfect it's it's a lot easier than me having to study a language and then do this research it, it really lowers the cost of entry so there's a really cool term that uh, uh my, my old boss dave discovered um called this intermediation and it kind of means that that there's in this intermediation there's no intermediate intermediaries. So if you want to, if you're person A and you want to talk to person C, you don't have to go through a person B. You can just talk directly to person C. Um, with the internet and social media, you know, it makes it um, very easy, let's say on InfoSec Twitter, if, if you're really interested in talking to a top security researcher that has their DMs open and you want to ask them about, you know, uh, some advice, you could just message them directly. In the past, you may have to go through a broker or a recruiter that knows them to get your question across. 
Uh, but now that's not there. Um, this is also uh, something that comes up, let's say in the drug industry. In the past, if you're a college student and you wanted to buy some drugs, you might have to go to you know, a broker. But now we know students buy stuff off the dark net directly from vendors. Um, it's also like, this also applies to extremist groups. Around uh, 2014 to 2016, there were a lot of uh, young girls in uh, the UK who were meeting boys in ISIS and other groups in Syria. And they had very you know, sad lives in the UK. They were bored and they're able to directly connect with people that they met online, get married and have them fly them to Syria or Turkey where uh, they stayed afterwards. So disintermediation, like it's a very neutral term but it's important in the type of work we're discussing today. So if we want to look quickly at who um, Salman Belarus talked to, you can see on the top left, it's who he sends tweets to and then who receives tweets from. Overwhelmingly, he's sending tweets to independent researchers on Twitter, such as uh, Caliber Obscura. He is a um, amateur arms researcher. Um, He's very popular on Twitter. He will look at which terrorist groups are using what guns and where they may have came from. Um, we have some other researchers. I know Mr. Vavinsky and uh, Nod Woofers are also independent researchers that they just follow the Syrian war. So they're going to be talking to people that are involved if they're willing to talk back. And then Osama Belarus is receiving a lot of tweets from fans that are kind of just saying, hey, like, awesome job. Like, you know, we support your cause. You're doing great work in Syria. Like, they don't have to be people living in Syria. They could just be people complimenting him because they view him as a freedom fighter. The other cool thing that I was able to find is uh, in Brainspace, we, we had copies of, you know, all the 308,000 tweets. And I, was, I went through every single tweet that Salman Belarus had with uh, people. It's only about like two to 300 tweets. Um, and I found that he was talking to someone about how they can donate money to him through PayPal or Bitcoin. And they were talking about the logistical and security risks, um, which, which is really interesting because if you're working in the anti-money laundering space or if your um, job is to combat terrorism financing, this kind of data really isn't in the open source, but we could see that they're having conversations in person, uh, well, on Twitter, about what's a good way of, of sharing or sending me money from, from anywhere in the globe. And, and we could tell that he also has access to accounts in Turkey because of the conversation. On the bottom right, you see a, a just paste it um, page. I redacted the... Uh, the addresses uh, because this person is still alive but this person uh, raises money for people in Syria and is very well connected with all these fighters so if uh, some some of the people I talked to said that the person whose page this belongs to is physically in Syria other people told me that they're just a fan but either way if, if you're in law enforcement and your job is to look at a uh, Bitcoin um, and trace it, you have these breadcrumbs that you're finding everywhere. And uh, it's, it was very easily found in the, in the analysis tool that we have. And on the top right is a, is a kind of like a GoFundMe type uh, website that's used in Turkey, which we can see uh, this person is trying to raise money to release prisoners in Syria, which, you know, may lead to, you know, the cycle of human trafficking and kidnapping that leads to organized crime in conflicts groups. Um, if, if you're doing analysis on which crowdfunding sites are susceptible to, you know, uh, being misused, uh, you can find this in the open source what people are using to raise money. And that this account also, we redacted the, the uh, username from because it's still active. And uh, if you're law enforcement and you want access to the Bitcoin address, uh, on this page, uh, let me know uh, directly on Discord and we can discuss that. So um, I was exploring a lot of the, the multi-ego type uh, graph that we have 
built into BrainSpace. And uh, just looking at interesting usernames, looking at their profiles and seeing who they are, uh, we, we saw this interesting username. It was like 53 Muslim 53 And I clicked on him and I went to his channel, uh, his uh, Twitter page, and we could see that uh, his pinned tweet or his most recent tweet was uh, ex explaining how different grenades and fuses work. Uh, I didn't know if this, this guy was just reposting these videos from somewhere else or if he was the fighter on the ground that is sharing these tweets. Uh, my conclusion is that he is actually a fighter on the ground. And one of the ways that we can tell that is um, the he has a lot of fighters on the ground in Syria post like very candid videos that aren't highly edited, kind of like you can see on the bottom, he has a video of just using his walkie talkie. He has another video of him, you know, shooting a gun and running through a building. Uh, this account isn't active anymore. So unfortunately, you guys won't be able to see. Um, but yeah, we we can see a lot of this just by who is connected to Salman Belarus and who is connected to the people following Salman Belarus. So um, this is another person we found in our Twitter data set. You can see that they uh, they they post candid pictures at their dinner, which uh, I know many of us do here in uh, in Infosec Twitter. We like to show what we're eating or what we made because we're proud of it. Um, this person I found because they were quoting Osama bin Laden in their tweet, and as you can see that they they don't really just call Osama bin Laden Osama bin Laden. They're calling him Sheikh Osama bin Laden. That word is a bit. It gives him a bit of reverence in uh, if, if you like him. And we have several ways of finding this tweet. One is manually through the um, visual graph interface. Another way is if I did a query for Osama bin Laden or for Sheikh Osama bin Laden, or because we had OCR'd all these images, we could have just looked up, uh, hey, show me all the pictures that have Osama bin Laden or Sheikh Osama in them. And so there's multiple ways of discovering these these actors. And uh, you really just got to work with what fits with you as an open source intelligence investigator or who your client is, what the end goal is of your investigation. Another very interesting thing I found in this uh, space, and I got permission from uh, Caliber Obscura to share this, is that uh, we saw that Salman Belarus was talking to researchers like uh, like like him, uh, just to show off his guns or to sh you know give more press on his group because that helps his PR. And the better PR he has, you know, the more support he may have on the ground or internationally. If he has support internationally, that means that people may donate money to him uh, to help him buy weapons or to help him, you know, in operations. Uh, there's several dozen amateur researchers on Twitter. And they're all, I mean, they have their own focuses, but there's many of them that they follow foreign fighters on the ground. And they're doing the same thing that we know in disintermediation. They're getting interviews directly from people that are there. Um, I've followed some of the most prominent researchers with the Sock Puppet account that I made. So, and when I was going through our data set, I could see, hey, like this unknown username is being followed by like these two respected researchers. That may imply that this person is an actual fighter on the ground. One of the hard things in, a, in the whole space where we're looking at jihadi content is, is the person posting this an actual jihadist or are they just a fan that's reposting stuff that they found? So doing a little bit of a, you know, kind of like, who is this person related to kind of analysis will help you um, determine whether or not a person is on the ground. And while some people may ask, uh, I respect the privacy of, you know, the community of researchers online. I'm not going to provide a list of uh, who to stock. Uh, you can look up Caliber Obscura. He's very popular, but he has around 40,000 followers. So maybe there's going to be a lot more noise than uh, what it was several years ago when he didn't have that many followers. So we're going to be looking at some cool stuff using Google's Vision API. 
So on the photo on the left is a um, eulogy poster of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's son, the, the leader, of, the former leader of ISIS. He was killed in an operation, and um, they, the media groups affiliated with ISIS, they, they wrote like, oh, like, um, you know, the son of the caliph um, has passed away, you know, give him prayers and blessings. Uh, if someone in ISIS was to just post this photo, there's no way you can find that on Twitter with just a query, a normal query with, with, with a string or with keywords. Uh, but when you're ingesting this into Google uh, Cloud and you're doing optical character recognition, you can either look up the word Shahuda, which means martyr. You can look up the Wilayat uh, Hims, which is the, the province of ISIS uh, geographically where this operation happened. Um, or any other keywords. Um, this one's interesting because they have both languages, but if this was only in Arabic and I also look up an English query of Khalifa, as long as the Arabic word translates into something similar to Khalifa, it would pull it up. So while like this looks like it might be a very interesting tweet we found, it may not be. Um, this was not an ISIS supporter. This was just a, a researcher reposting news. So he did include the image and he was like, hey, like, you know, Baghdadi's son was killed in this operation. Uh, but, but this guy is just a researcher. So there's, uh, you know, nothing to be worried about. It, it's not like people would just like, you know, post a picture that they say that they love Osama bin Laden, right? Except that they do. <laughs> so um, when I was looking up instances of people mentioning Osama bin Laden uh, in images, I, I stumbled across this account. And uh, I went to their profile, and this guy, uh, Javid, this account isn't active anymore. Uh, he's very pro-Taliban. Uh, I think he, he appeared to be Turkish in origin. I found some old pictures of him sitting in a, on a park bench in uh, Istanbul. And then uh, he was posting these nice, like, Tumblr-esque photos of, like, what looked like a European city. And uh, he, like... You can see this tweet, it's three images. There's uh, him writing something in the snow and him walking through a town. He wrote in the snow, Talib, which means student. And we know that's a rude word for Taliban. And then there's just like this uh, town. I was really interested in seeing what this town is. And what I did is I went to the second picture in that tweet and the building had a logo on it and it said NTA. And I put that in every single logo uh, reverse image search. I did Google searches on Google searches to try to figure out, like, is this like a resort building or company? Who is this person? What town are they in? Do they support the Taliban? Is this Europe? Um, it was really difficult at first. Um, I found this really cool image of him uh, holding a, a Taliban flag on top of a hill. And uh, this looks like a European city. And uh, we had some people in the office that were uh, had spent time in Europe living there or working there. And uh, we spent uh, several minutes and, and we couldn't figure out where this was. Uh, the target also had a, a Periscope account. And he posted some videos walking through the city uh, with some license plates showing, but they were too blurry to capture their pattern or their numbers. And I couldn't figure out um, what they were. Eventually, I slept it over. I was like, hey, like, I'm just going to do this tomorrow when I get back to the office. And I went back to the Periscope account. And we saw that uh, the first two broadcasts he had done had the location enabled. And when I, and it was a very small town in Germany. When I looked at the location on Google Earth and Google Maps, I was able to geolocate uh, all the photos in the town and confirm that this person was indeed in this European city. Uh, this person was also interesting because they were making TikTok videos for the Taliban. Uh, I don't know if they're doing it in an official capacity or if they're just fanboys. There's a lot of those online. Uh, but you can see, like, he gets decent engagement on pictures just like the one on the hillside. So, unfortunately, we can't look this person up now. Uh, and I've redacted their privacy because uh, 
you know, I'm not here to accuse them of a crime. I just think it's interesting what content they choose to post. The other uh, interesting natural language process capability we found is uh, since you can look into what's posted in images, you can look up handles of, of, of Twitter accounts. So I looked up, let me, look, I want to look up pictures that have Salman Belarus's handle. So we have uh, Miles from Sula Report that talked about how Mohama Tactical is fundraising for airsoft rifles for training people. And in his tweet is a picture he got from Salman Belarus where it has his hand, Twitter handle. And then on the right side, you have someone that I think doesn't like Salman Belarus. And they talked about how Salman Belarus said that there'd be a surprise in the coming weeks and that surprise never came. So I think he's just making fun of Salman Belarus. But if you've been on Twitter long enough, you know that people post screenshots of other people's tweets because maybe they don't want to be censored if they're um, quote tweeting someone because that other person will be notified if you quote tweet someone. Maybe they expect that tweet to be deleted or maybe they just don't want the other person to know that they're subtweeting. And the way you can get around that is by posting photos. And this is an interesting capability, um, especially when archive.org may not have enough data on your target uh, or other archiving sites. So um, we have another uh, look at extracting text from images. Uh, we have this photo from the UK of uh, Anjum Chowdhury, who is a very notorious preacher. Uh, Google's API was able to pull all of the text from all the posters that its supporters have because they write it in English and it's generally structured text. So if I want to look up the term Khalifa again, or uh, Caliph, we could see that it comes up in one of their posters. Um, I was expecting to find more ISIS related propaganda by doing these queries, but I didn't get them. And I think part of the reason is uh, the groups that Osama Belarus is affiliated with are not pro-ISIS groups. They're more pro Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which is more of an Al-Qaeda aligned group. And they have a lot of ideological differences with ISIS. So the people that follow HTS will necessarily follow ISIS. And therefore the Twitter data set that we have may not be as uh, useful to find ISIS propaganda. So the things that we do find are, are mainly researchers that uh, that are talking about uh, people and doing things. Yeah. Uh, this is a very, very uh, cool feature of Brainspace. Um, I sat into a very cool webinar by uh, the Dutch OSINT guy, Nico, uh, by, on, on SANS, and he showed a cool website called relatedwords.org where if you look up any city or any topic, it'll show you the most affiliated uh, uh, keywords with, with it. So if I'm, if I'm American and I'm doing a, an investigation in Paris or I'm trying to infiltrate uh, a French group online and I don't know anything about, about France or Paris, I'll look up Paris in relatedwords.org and it'll show me you know, different things affiliated with um, the, the, the city or things that, feel, that are similar. Uh, RelatedWords.org is pulling this from the internet and from dictionaries. Uh, Brainspace is a very similar feature, but it'll find related words in your own data set. So on the bottom, we have a screenshot from one of the product demos that I found online. And uh, the data that was ingested was food related. I think it may have been uh, cooking manuals. Um, the query is wine. And you could see some of the related words on the bottom, uh, just like Pinot, Pinot Noir. Like, I don't know much about alcohol, but I found out that Pinot Noir is like a type of wine. So as an analyst, if, if you're very limited in what you think is um, your keywords for investigation, you can just put in what you know and Brainspace can tell you more relevant keywords. Uh, we use this to, to extremely effective ends in the next part of the presentation. So uh, 
we you know we might know that you know some of the most famous people in in, in terrorism uh contemporarily are like osama bin laden uh, anwar al-awlaki the american who went to al-qaeda in the arabian peninsula but more in common are people like abdullah azam and uh, thomas heghammer wrote a very good book on this topic earlier this year uh he's kind of known as a grandfather of isis a uh, grandfather of al-qaeda my bad and uh there's there's different like sheikhs and religious leaders and um extremist group people that have different reverence in different jihadist communities so osama bin laden may be universally liked by jihadists while Un and anwar al al lucky might also be universally liked by um extremists but abdullah azam might be more liked by extremists that are more into al-qaeda um, when I use the feature in Brainspace that we saw previously where it will tell you similar words, I kept on seeing names like Azam bin Laden come up and Brainspace suggested to me that there's variations or similar words that for some reason are related. Um, and we saw that, you know, at least for Osama bin Laden in our data set, we saw the word uh, Say Osama and Say Osama bin Laden, which, uh, it translates to Sheikh Osama bin Laden in Turkish. And the the big difference is, you know, if someone's talking about Osama bin Laden from an academic point of view, they're just going to call him bin Laden. But if someone's talking to him in reverence, they're going to say Sheikh. And um, I was able to come up with uh, all these like aliases and nicknames that are used extremely exclusively by jihadists and jihadist sympathizers. And this isn't an exhaustive list. Uh, we can talk about that privately if you're interested in learning more about how do you do this. And this is mainly in Turkish. There's so many more languages out there that people will talk about terrorism online. So if we look into Abdullah Azam, we can see that on the top, I wrote a query where I'm looking up every entity, person of every variation of Abdullah Azam that I know of in my data set. And what it comes up with as a result is this map of people that may be talking about Abdulazam in their normal discourse on Twitter. So these people are the researchers that are just talking about him as a research point of view. These people are talking about him in reverence. So as an analyst, you have a much more focused uh, scope if you're looking at these targets. Uh, when you know they're talking about a specific person. So, like I said, like I don't need to be a linguist or a Turkish linguist or Arabic linguist to do this kind of work or to find these breadcrumbs. But I do have a general good understanding of the terrorism culture. I've been self-studying this for a very long time. And uh, your analysts can, can, can do that too. And it's a lot easier to look into and study a culture than it is to study an entire language. So Brainspace has been used a lot in uh, the disinformation space uh, to discover campaigns. That's what my previous research has been in when I spoke in Canada and San Francisco. So I wanted to talk a little bit about like, how do they differ? So disinformation networks have certain shapes to them. Uh, they, can, they look uh, like star, starfish patterns, and we'll see that in the next slide. Um, there's a lot of signal boosting. And there's been a lot of mainstream research into how you can look into them. On the other hand, terrorist groups are more hidden in plain sight because they act like human networks. And like human networks, they know that they may be being watched and they'll adjust their behavior to compensate so they don't get banned. So um, the other problem we have is, you know, are people just mentioning extremists and popular people from an academic point of view? Are they just reposting terrorist content? Or are they originally posting things because they're part of these groups on the ground? Um, in the disinformation industry, we, kind of, we call this signals. So signals are heuristics, uh, artifacts that are extremely unique to certain groups. Um, and to find these signals, you need to have a cultural understanding of what group you're looking at, but you don't need to be a linguist. Um, we're gonna look at what a 
bot looks like real quick. So this is what a bot network looks like. This is this is one of my favorite bots. I spoke about this in November, and I even spoke to with one of Twitter's abuse teams about this bot, and they still haven't deleted it. Uh, I'm sure it's just not a priority. It, it just spews uh, propaganda all day, and 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 you can see if you go to these accounts that they have they're pulling the pictures from someone's Instagram. They're highly inauthentic and their behavior is fully automated. Um, but if we look at the th these communities, we see they're more natural. There's people of two, three, five talking to each other. It's not the same starfish pattern. On the context uh, and the topic of signals, uh, uh, Ray is a, a, is a friend that works at DFR Lab, and he was talking about how a recent Facebook takedown on Myanmar uh, was difficult because it took his team a very long time to find those signals that were affiliated with the inauthentic um, content that was being pushed by this government. But when he did find that signal, Facebook with their big data set were able to query that at scale to discover where propaganda was coming from and ultimately take it down. So similarly to like he uses the term signals and I use the term signals too because I found the signals like the language uh, modifiers that were useful for our work. So one one really cool um, tool in our toolbox that I haven't used personally but it's been in the news a lot is uh, so there's a huge marketplace for contract tracing and location data. Uh, the New York Times did this great article on how your privacy is at stake if you own a modern cell phone. And um, the, if, if you look into it, there's a huge industry of companies that um, they, they, they sit on apps that may be popular, but they're collecting your geolocation data and they're selling that to advertisers. Um, this is happening all around the world. Uh, I was able to get a demo for one of these products uh, past couple months. And I looked into this uh, location that we see on the right. So this is Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's uh, compound in Idlib, Syria, where he was killed uh, last year. And I made a, a graph, a, a little circle similar to this size. And I was like, hey, show me all the cell phones that have passed through this area in the past two months before the raid happened. So. I did that query and I found phones that are still active to this day that may or may not have had a connection to the compound where Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is. And this is just commercially available. You just need to know where to buy this data from. I'm not gonna be talking about what vendor I did this through. Uh, they didn't allow me to talk about that, but you can find this on your own. And we, we've seen where how Geolocation data is very useful in other leaks like the Strava uh, fitness data leaks uh, a couple years ago. Some lessons that I learned personally doing this investigation is that um, evidence collection and management is uh, tricky and that, um, you know, archiving pages and accounts one by one may uh, take a while. Um, I, look in, I looked into Hunchly, which is made by a member of the OSINT community, Justin Seitz, and it appears to be very useful for the type of work that I would like to do, uh, that I've done with this, uh, with this research. Um, I also suggest that uh, you make a clean social media account to investigate the community you're, you're looking at, but you need to make sure that you pretext into that community before you do your investigations, because people get suspicious and they'll block you. The other uh, lesson I learned the hard way is that accounts get deleted very quickly, especially recently in the past, late 2019, early 2020, when it comes to terrorist content or foreign fighters on the ground. I found two backup um, accounts for uh, Salman Belarus, and uh, I found them late at night as I'm scrolling through Twitter, and I tell myself, hey, it's late. When I wake up in the morning, I'm gonna scrape this on Twint. And I wake up in the morning and it's deleted, and it sucks. <laughs> because I, I lost all that data. And you know that happened to me not once, but twice. So my, my suggestion is look into how you wanna script data. And uh, yeah, that's my 10 minute warning. Um, 
Yeah, look into how you want to script data and uh, how you want to scrape accounts and have that ready whenever you have uh, a target you want to look into. Uh, the other logo you see is Buscador. Um, I didn't write about this, but uh, some people prefer to have dedicated VMs for their investigations. I didn't find it necessary for the work I was doing because I didn't use too many uh, OSINT tools. Um, but uh, I didn't use like the pen testing tools that we're used to in this industry. Uh, but it is out there if, if you just prefer to have make your own workflow like that. Other capabilities we have with, uh, with Brainspace um, and with Twitter investigations that I didn't use for this project, but you should look into is uh, my disinformation work that I presented in Canada. A, a countermeasure that's on YouTube. I have a, a website and blog where I talk about uh, some of these topics and I have my slides and references from my previous conferences. Um, uh, Dave Atel at Immunity had done some great walkthroughs looking at Russian propaganda. Uh, the IRA tweet data set uh, that Clemson did and we ingested that into brain space and um, saw how we could do the research differently. And one of the linguistic modifiers that he saw, uh, just to give you an example, is that uh, in the IRA tweet data set, the, the Russians were using an apostrophe that looks like a normal apostrophe to you and me for humans reading it, but it comes from the Cyrillic uh, keyboard. So it has a different ASCII code that maps to that character. So if you have a big data way of looking at a Twitter data, you can say, hey, I'm not looking for apostrophes. I'm looking for all the tweets that contain this character that looks like an apostrophe that may be from a keyboard in the region I'm investigating. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah. So the I did this research a year ago. Since then, there's been uh, evolving uh, TTPs on behalf of the people we're looking at. Um, we saw that... Um, uh, a lot of foreign fighters have been transitioning from Twitter to Telegram. Uh, we saw that they changed their names to more Western names, like uh, Salman Belarus switched his name to Nick Walker, uh, but he also got banned. Um, and this was recently posted by Switched on Twitter. He found an ISIS uh, Telegram channel that has, uh, you know, cats. So uh, they're getting, they're they're trying to be careful not to get banned all the time. And you should know that uh, as an investigator. So some of the applications that I want to see with this technology is to prevent or alert events of terrorism. Uh, the Christchurch shooter, for example, posted his arsenal on Twitter before he committed his act of violence. And he wrote in plain English and human readable and machine readable English and other languages, uh, you know, names of people that may have been signals in the alt-right, far-right movement. Um, that may be able to be you may be able to pick that up in real time depending on uh if that's a priority for the teams at facebook or twitter uh wherever they're active outside of terrorism you can apply this to any group you're investigating whether they're hacker groups um or if there are any social any social group uh any anyone we can apply these uh tools to we can also instead of just twitter data look at instagram data facebook data vk TikTok, telegram you just gotta scrape it, ingest it into whatever um, analysis software you're doing and enrich it with Google's uh, tools. And this analysis was done by me, one analyst in two months on one data set with a very small budget. And this is everything I found. You know, imagine what you can do at scale with automation, budgets, and an entire team of analysts, uh, similar to government agencies like the National Counterterrorism Center. Uh, where they have hundreds of people, hundreds of analysts. So there, there's a lot more out there. Uh, also, you know, to close this off, we have a, a we see that this is kind of a change in in, in warfare. We have um, human intelligence online. We have the cyber component. We have information operations on Twitter. Uh, threat actors that don't like Salman Belarus, like the Russians or Syrians. I can guarantee you that they're also monitoring them on Twitter. And he eventually, he, he did end up, uh, I know he faked his death earlier, but he actually did die last summer. So um, I believe that whoever targeted him was able to do so because they were, they mapped his behaviors. 
this is some of what we learned. Uh, I'm going to go through the last slide real quick because we're running out of time. Um, but this is kind of what I hope you guys will take, get some takeaways um, and be able to apply to your own in OSINT investigations, even if they're not related to terrorism. These are some great resources I recommend you guys look into, some great uh, Twitter accounts. Uh, shout out to Caliber and uh, Miles and Switch for helping me a little bit with this presentation. These are some other groups you can look into or join if you're interested in combating terrorism or extremism online. Um, if you're looking for me, uh, I'm, I just graduated, so I'm looking for a job. Uh, so if, if, if you have any leads uh, or if you want to hire me, we can talk about that. I'm going to be posting the slides in a couple days. Um, my, on my Twitter is Lockheed Martini. My email is here. I'm on LinkedIn too. And you can message me on the Discord server if uh, you have any direct questions. But, but yeah, uh, we've got to get to questions now. Uh, Michael, can you help with that? Do we have time? Yep, we've got we we've got a little bit of time, so let's go ahead and see if we can um, hit up with a couple questions. Uh, uh, one question that uh, has been coming through: there's been a lot of discussion about the um, how the data set got compiled and um, really what criteria uh, that you were using the process for um, putting the putting the data together. So, can you um, highlight a little more about the process that you went through to collect the data? Yeah, so I'm not a data engineer, but I believe the team at Immunity used an application or package called Tweety Bird, which uh, you can identify a target account. You can say how many tweets you want to download from that account, and you can download the networks related to that account. So this is kind of like the process, and we have the uh, technology stack here. Uh, if you want to talk more in detail about that, do hit me up on Discord. I think there's a lot more details that. I can't do in, a, in under a minute. Uh, next question, Michael. Sure. So um, one of the things that occurred to me as I was listening to your talk, and this has been fantastic, Zeeshan. So I know um, folks on the uh, Track Two uh, channel have really appreciated it. Is really what are what are some of the ways that you um, assess who is a jihadist versus a fanboy versus a researcher is it really just your subjective sort of look at the at the information that you're seeing is it is it um seeing how often they're being connected and um you know what what are some of the ways that you're making that determination a uh, great connection because online there's a lot of fanboys and, and there's a lot less actual fighters on the ground uh one thing that i did notice with these two uh, accounts that we were flipping through right now is 53 Muslim had a lot more candid videos. Uh, if you're a poster, if you're a reposter, you're probably just gonna post like the epic like fight battles or epic like explosion videos. But people that are on the ground, you know, they're human. They share their lunch, like <laughs> or their dinner. They're gonna be posting um, like low resolution image uh, videos. They might even have very few views. Like 53 Muslim has 43 views on that video. He has 109 views on this walkie talkie video. The other thing that I found is that a lot of these or some of these foreign fighters are being followed by respected researchers in this field of counterterrorism, which I know that some of them interview these people and write blog posts. So that's how I can tell that they're probably real fighters. It's just that I'm not going to disclose those researchers are because I don't want them to have to adopt because all of a sudden all these people from layer eight are stalking their accounts or causing their sources to go offline. Uh, I believe that answers the question, right, Michael? So we can go to the next one. Yeah, I think it does. Uh, yeah. Thank you for that. And one more question I'll throw out, and we are a couple minutes over time. Um, but okay. uh, just I want to I want to pay out uh, call out to um, Didymus um, asking earlier in the presentation about being able to tell the difference between. Um, uh, researchers and perhaps uh, um, psyops programs and so any any thoughts as far as how to determine whether or not someone you're seeing is actually part of more of an operational program uh, I mean operational like part of a terrorist group versus being part of a researcher I think it could probably be a variety okay so uh, actually very good question and, and I didn't put this in my presentation but there's some foreign fighters on the ground uh, talking about evolving TTPs. They used to say in their bio that they're a jihadi in Idlib or in other parts of Syria. 
But then they started using terms like, oh, I'm just a journalist visiting the area. And uh, yeah, so like some people, and, and I have on my back end, I looked into uh, probably just under 100 like jihadist related accounts of potential foreign fighters. Um, they may claim they're journalists or they're just researchers, but they're actually like propagandists on the ground that are doing information operations or, you know, they're doing the propaganda aspect of warfare. Uh, I have inside sources because of the relationships I've built with some of the people in the community on who the, some of those journalists or people faking to be journalists are actually fighters. Uh, but I, I won't be able to discuss individual cases or accounts. Uh, those are great questions, guys. I'm, I'm glad we had a, just under uh, 100 people come to this talk. Do hit me up either in the track two uh, Slack channel and I can answer questions publicly. Or if you want to ask me something privately, you can uh, message me directly on the Discord, my bad. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much for, uh, you know, letting me part of this cohort of great OSIM people. Um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the talks. Great. And with that, Zishan, thank you very much for um, presenting here at Layer 8 uh, Virtual. And uh, just a reminder to you, I'll dismiss you so that uh, we uh, don't have any sort of technical problems here. But again, uh, make sure to check out track two, everyone, uh, for the commentary and uh, ping uh, Zishan up directly at Lockheed Martini. And with that, we're going to go ahead and